Yes, let's begin. Thank you for joining us today for a deep dive into high voltage standard product power supply advantages. I'm Jim Morrison, advisor to the high voltage marketing team at Advanced Energy. In addition to AE's world leading process power products in RF plasma, high power ACDC, thermal pyrometers, and power control modules, we also offer an extensive high voltage power supply product line. That high voltage power supply product line consists of catalog, catalog derivative, and custom models for general purpose and application specific solutions. It's those catalog standard products and their derivatives that we'll focus on today. High voltage standard product power supply advantages. As is noted on the slide, in fast time to market situations, specifying funding and managing a custom high voltage power supply project is often not an option. Standard high voltage power supplies and derivatives can offer a solution that enables designers to meet tough timelines and challenging specifications, as well as deliver some key features and performance requirements. Our agenda kicks off with some basics for those of you new to high voltage. We then go into what are standard product high voltage power supplies, as well as their advantages and disadvantages. What are derivatives of those power supplies? And then we look at some high voltage power supply examples. Going deeper, we move through the most important specification elements of high voltage power quality making sure to cover some key performance specifications in general and some high performance capabilities and applications. This will include suggestions to designers who are responsible for selecting, testing, and integrating the high voltage. Obviously important in making reliable high performance high voltage a reality in your system and probably one of the reasons why you're here joining us today. We'll then wrap up with a question and answer session. What is high voltage? Well, UL states any voltage above 48 volts is considered high voltage. Uh, the CE low voltage directive states any voltage above 1000. High voltage is inherently dangerous. If you're not experienced in high voltage, please get proper training, take proper precautions, don't take chances. Only certified personnel with the proper equipment and training should work on high voltage based systems. Those personnel have gained the experience and the knowledge to know they should not work when the system's power is energized. They should always use a grounding stick and keep it in place. And the high voltage area should be secure so people don't accidentally enter into that space and the equipment when uh, it's in service mode should be locked out or tagged out. Where is high voltage used? When reviewing what high voltage is used for, I like to start off with emitters of energy and detectors of energy. Emitters of energy are devices such as electron beam sources, including X-ray, uh, ion beam sources, lasers, uh, RF, RF modulators, ultrasonics, uh, electrostatics. These are the devices that are using the high voltage to actually generate uh, an energy source at some other wavelength or spectrum. And then detectors measure that energy across either that wavelength or broader wavelengths. So you're either doing a, an analysis of the spectrum of energy uh, or you're doing an analysis of the energy level or both. Let's wrap up our review of where high voltage is used by taking a look at some performance high voltage applications. Avionics displays, military commercial, medical equipment like CAT scans, MRI, life science equipment like DNA sequencers, mass spectrometers, electrophoresis, um, and then different types of uh, patient treatment such as proton beam systems, um, general industrial devices like radiation monitors, electron microscopes, 
um, and also security systems, semiconductor tools, um, lasers, which could be medical, industrial, uh, x-ray inspection, which could be um, industrial or security. A high voltage performance in these applications often determines the overall performance of the system. Uh, designing and integrating um, are paramount to optimum system, system performance and to the quality of the system. Selecting the right high voltage product for the right application is key. So now that we've covered what is high voltage, let's get into the topic at hand. Specifically, what are standard product high voltage power supplies? And those are devices that are pre-engineered product families. They have a range of output voltage, current, power. Often across a particular family of products, they have common features, functions, and controls. And uh, for some product lines, they also have pre-engineered options. And that lets a designer specify a device that's a little bit more application specific. So now, let's take a look at what are the advantages and disadvantages of evaluating a standard product solution. So advantages are bulleted here, uh, and there are more than are listed, but these seem to be the ones that are the strongest and the ones that are most impactful. Uh, build to order lead times are typically shorter than a custom design project. And in a fast time to market situation, that is obviously very important. Low or no minimum order quantity, which of course means that um, you can select uh, different devices for testing uh, during science R&D or proof of concept uh, without necessarily, let's say, blowing your budget or building up a large inventory of devices you may not use as you select the one that's most optimum for your application. Um, the standard products can be you know, easily changed um, in your application generally across the family. So you can switch from model to model within a family, um, often without changing connector types or significant programming variables. You might have to change your scaling if you're, for example, moving from a 2kV to a 4kV, um, or you might have to change it if you went to a higher power level or lower power level, but that's nominal changes. And these types of devices support fast development and time to market cycles, as I mentioned, because you could be doing um, R&D or science or proof of concept and have to switch models. And if you can stay in the same family, um, you could be looking at a substantially shorter timeline to getting product to test than let's say initiating a new custom product or a major revision to your custom specification. And uh, the final advantage highlighted here is you're looking at a proven design with proven manufactured quality as well as reliability in your target application. And you know, that can be a substantial um, advantage if you're in a tight time to market and you're concerned about uh, the long-term reliability or having to do long-term reliability testing. Um, that often puts you in a position where the device you're selecting has already been proven in the marketplace, proven in the application and therefore can um, you know, put your project in a, a more positive light. There are disadvantages. Uh, standard products can be larger in size than a custom. And uh, that's usually because of um, additional features that it might be equipped with that you might not necessarily have in the specific product application you have. So those additional features or functions or performance um, may not be needed by your application. And because it's in the standard product, it means a product is going to be a little bit larger than a tailored custom. It's also typically going to be more costly than a tailored custom um, because you're paying for some things you may not need. Of course, the advantage is you may not uh, be paying any NRE at all or a small amount of NRE. You certainly will not necessarily be going through the same amount of initial product during your testing. and uh, certainly your testing is going to be on a shorter timeline, which can help you save uh, substantial program funds in other ways. The other thing to consider is the standard product may not have your preferred connections. 
Uh, you may prefer an, an IDC connector, but the one that's best meeting your needs might have a D connector. You might prefer a D connector that's a male or a female or a certain number of pins, and it might be equipped with something different. The interface might be different. It might be a 10 volt interface and you're looking for five, or it might be five and you're looking for 10. Uh, or the mechanical outline, the proportion between length and width and height might be different than your optimum. If, if you can see your way past these things, depending on the stage of your project, you might be obviously able to adjust your mechanical design or your interfacing or your cabling so that you can take these um, differences into account and therefore, again, have a faster project and a faster time to market. So you have a standard product in mind. It nearly meets your requirements. You like some of the advantages. You can see your way past some of the disadvantages. Yet you need that power supply to do just a little bit more in a particular way. Well, that is what standard product high voltage power supply derivatives are for. Derivatives are built from proven standard product platforms with changes that enable the power supply to perform better in a specific application. Designers can outline the changes that they require. Manufacturers can often make those changes quickly to limited quantities to assist the designer's proof of concept efforts. And when those changes are optimized through maybe one or two cycles of that so that the designer gets exactly what they need for their application. Those changes can be made permanent for production by the manufacturer. So let's look at some examples. The first example is probably the most popular request for a derivative. That's rearranging the output voltage and current to more or less power so you might have an application where your device needs to run at 1.5 kV and 75 milliamps. You would like to have a little headroom on the 75 milliamps. You'd like to have a little headroom on the 1.5 kV. And the standard product that comes closest to the interface you'd like, the package size you'd like, some of the performance elements that you would like is a 2 kV device. So you'd like the manufacturer to rearrange the voltage from 2 kV down to 1500 or 1600. Rearrange the current because as you reduce the voltage, you can theoretically increase the current at the same power level, providing the components are rated for it within their ratings, within their safe operating area. If that was done, the 2 kV 125 watt standard product, which made 62 milliamps, becomes a 1.5 kV 125 watt product rated for 83 milliamps. And now you have headroom. Now you have the device that you specifically need for your application. So what if you needed to do almost the opposite? What if you were very concerned about your device being damaged by the power supply? And you could use the 2 kV device maybe you only needed 50 milliamps. However, going much above that 1500 volts would maybe damage your device. You could have the power supply limited, and that's our second bullet, limit the output voltage and or the output current. So you could ask the manufacturer to limit the output to 15 or 1600 volts. So it would not accidentally damage your device. So if there was a, a circuit design error, if there was a component load error, if there was a bad component on your control boards, if there was a programming mistake, the power supply simply would not have the capability to damage your device. Likewise, you might have a safety agency issue. Maybe you can't go above five milliamps or two milliamps or one milliamp in an application and you've selected a power supply that's just ideal for what you'd like to do, except it has a little bit more current, you can have the manufacturer limit the output current. 
Our third type of derivative from a popularity standpoint is to optimize a key parameter, such as response time or ripple or noise. Let's take the response time as an example. So you're charging a capacitor. You want to charge that capacitor in seven and a half milliseconds. However, the power supply only charges that capacitor in 10 milliseconds. The power supply could be optimized for your application. Uh, with that external capacitor, you may be in a position where by removing some capacitors from the power supply, more of the energy is going to your capacitive load. You still might be able to achieve your ripple goal because there's still a large amount of capacitance. And so re-optimizing the power supply so there's less stored energy in the filter and more of uh, the power being generated, more of the current being generated, more of the energy being produced is going into the load. Another example of optimizing key parameters is reducing ripple or reducing noise. That could be achieved through additional components, another filter element, more storage capacitance, uh, adding a shielded cable assembly. And these could impact your product size. They could impact your cost. However, again, it, it might be an advantage to you to get the product in this application specific configuration because it's the easiest way for you to achieve your goal. Another example of a derivative is special environmental testing. You could be on a mission critical project. You'd like the product tested at altitude. You'd like the product tested at extended temperature. You'd like the product tested uh, in an extended arcing condition. Maybe you'd like all the power supplies in a batch to be tested that way because you'd like to be assured of a higher level of reliability for the entire batch uh, so that in your mission critical application, you don't have downtime. It could also be in an application where you simply can't get to the product. So you need to have the absolute highest level of reliability you can. And so you wanna put it through an additional reliability testing program. Our last example of derivatives here is to remove unnecessary features, functions, or product performance. This is going to reduce the cost because you're not going to be paying for the components or the installation of those components. It also would reduce your cost because you're not testing those functions uh, or you're not yielding some product because of not meeting those functions or reworking. And that does happen. It's part of manufacturing. It's part of delivered quality. So overall, you end up with a lower total cost solution. And uh, that puts you in a position to be successful in a different way with your project. Let's look at standard product high voltage power supply examples. The unit on the left is a rack mount high voltage power supply. These devices are typically AC input power. And that would be fixed AC, universal AC, or power factor corrected AC, a fixed meaning 110, 120, switchable to 220, 230, universal meaning automatically adjust from 90 to 230 volts AC. And power factor correction enables higher power operation from the power line. Rack mount devices like this a manufacturer may have hundreds of versions over a range of power from 20 watts to 120 kilowatts, as an example, with advanced energy devices, and a range of voltage from zero to 62 volts through 100 kilovolts. These units can have some top features such as low ripple, high accuracy and stability, multiple outputs, and application specific versions. Top functions can be analog, digital interfaces, or both. Uh, arc count and extinguish systems. And extreme arc protection. It's a larger power supply. It has more stored energy. It's generating more power. And it can have uh, some substantial um, energy management devices inside of it. If we look to the right, 
we have an example of two different types of modular high voltage power supplies. One is a chassis mount and one is a printed circuit board mount. These devices are typically DC input power. Uh, the most popular, probably 24 volts, uh, followed by uh, 12 volt, 5 volts, or even 48 volts. Output, again, the manufacturer would have hundreds of versions. Advanced Energy offers products from 100 milliwatts to 250 watts and over a similar range of voltage as the racks, 0 to 62 volts to 100 kilovolts. Top features are different. These are different devices. So small size, the device might bolt right to a chassis or be soldered and screwed right onto a printed circuit board. They may have very low ripple, very high accuracy and stability. They can be equipped with additional outputs and often are available in application specific versions. Top functions, analog interface with high precision or digital interface with high precision, also arc protection. Earlier on, we walked through some decision-making processes in evaluating a standard product. Let's go a little bit deeper into that. How do I select a standard product high voltage power supply when starting a new design? A fresh system design enables space to be allocated at the start of a project. Knowledge about the required specifications and potential for specification changes enables a designer to compare available standard products in the marketplace. Starting typically with the package type, is it going to be rack mount, chassis mount, PC board mount? And in this example, we have some dialog boxes that allow you to go through a logical thought process. Is the input power going to be AC or DC? What is the output voltage range? And does that output voltage have to have full performance below 10%? DC to DC high voltage power supplies have a minimum pulse width. At some point in time, the pulse width does not get any narrower. And the only way to reduce the output is to start dropping pulses. And that starts to give you discontinuous noise, which would impact performance. So a special type of power supply is required to adjust at full specification down to zero volts. Power supply would still adjust down to zero. It just would not have full specification below, in this example, 10%. Well, how much output current and power is required? And is that output current required at full voltage or across the entire range of voltage? Are there any key output specifications such as ripple or noise or accuracy? Are you looking for analog control or digital control? And if so, what kind? Are there key features? Do you need output voltage monitoring, current monitoring? Do you need programmable limits? Does it have to be a fast rise time, fast slew rate power supply? Do you need second or third outputs? And what about the operating environment? Is it industrial, medical, aerospace, military? Is it going to be a 45 degree C to zero environment, a 55 degree C to minus 30 environment? Is it going to be a 90 C or 125 C environment? Manufacturers typically have a product parametric search tool that allow you to pick some key elements such as these dialog boxes and these decision making boxes, uh, picking the package type or picking the input power or picking the output voltage or current or total output power. Uh, and those parametric search tools would enable to you to look at a range of devices. Additionally, manufacturers often will have a product quick select chart, which will allow you to visually walk through entire product lines looking for the differences between the product lines and aligning your specification requirements to those product lines at a high level. Now let's step into a deeper challenge. How do I select a standard product high voltage power supply when finishing a new design or selecting a replacement? So the design is fundamentally in place. So you start with a fixed space, and that can be a significant challenge. 
you may now have more knowledge about required specifications, so there's less risk about a spec change. However, a designer still has the challenge of comparing the available standard products in the marketplace to now this fixed space and that specification. So the sequence could be different. Now we start with available size and then go to package type, then go to operating environment because now we have more of that data. And then I'll output voltage, output current, key specifications, type of control, key features, input power. Because in this scenario, space is ruling the design. So the decision and dialog boxes are essentially the same. They're in a different order. However, the logical analysis is clearly sequenced differently because of the fixed space. Again, the product parametric search tool could be an easy way to look across the manufacturer's products. Advanced Energy has a fairly powerful one. And the product quick select chart. Uh, often they're organized by size and that enables you to quickly look across product families to select something that would fit in your space so you can start looking at some of the design trade-offs. Standard product high voltage power supply key specifications. The level of high voltage performance drives systems performance. It also drives the size of the product and the cost of the product. We've grouped key specifications into three sections here. Ripple and noise, ripple being the periodic AC component at the power supply frequency that rides on the DC output and noise, which is the low frequency periodic and random component that rides on the high voltage DC. They are often the top uh, performance drivers. The next group set of specifications is line regulation, static load regulation, dynamic load regulation, because they are the first key element of stability. And Across all three of these, the question is how much does the high voltage output change over a change in line, a change in load, and uh, a versus a one-time change in load or a constant change in load. The third group set of key specifications is really second order focus on stability. Temperature coefficient, how much does the output change for each one degree C change in case temperature? and stability and drift, which is the variation of the high voltage over time. So the last group often is modified by a warm up period. The power supply might warm up over 15 minutes or 30 minutes to stabilize, and therefore it, there's less delta temperature after that. There's less drift after that. When you can warm up at voltage and at load, you're in the most optimum situation because the power supply will have the most stability. In the second group, we're talking about regulation and we're looking at line regulation, uh, having less low voltage power supply change or less AC power change can also mean that you can achieve higher performance. Let's look at key specifications from a performance level point of view. Low performance product versus nominal performance product versus high performance product. So the standard product line pre-engineering would be at a particular performance level. Options may be available to make certain key specifications higher in performance, making that product line more application specific. It puts the designer in a position where they can decide, am I selecting a standard product as is, because it meets a performance level I'm looking for, am I selecting it with options, and therefore the designer can mix again package size, level of performance, maybe improve one specific type of specification to higher level performance and not all specifications, or perhaps all specifications because that's what they need. It's going to impact package size, it's going to impact cost, 
and this visualization well, lets you see what you would see if you looked at many different specifications across a number of product lines. Let's look at another interesting decision point in selecting a standard product. And that's how do I improve a standard product's performance myself in my application? Again, it could be science, R&D, proof of concept. External to the high voltage power supply, the designer can improve specific performance items. Uh, often at nominal expense, the improved performance can be achieved by putting additional components on the power supply. You'll need to budget for those components. You'll need, uh, obviously, to install those components. It's still going to take up additional space. It's something you can do in the lab, so you do not necessarily have to have a, a derivative right up front. And maybe it's something that you can comfortably do in your design because you have an ability to add those components because of other components you're adding as part of your system design. So you can talk to the supplier's field applications engineering team to get some suggestions on things you can do external to the power supply. And some of the more common ones are, again, reducing output ripple and improving stability. And reducing output ripple, you could switch to a shielded cable, as is noted here. You can increase the length of the shielded cable. You can add a bypass capacitor to high voltage output. Uh, improving stability, you can uh, use a higher quality reference, voltage reference, that is tighter in tolerance, tighter in temperature coefficient instead of the internal reference. And you can also specify uh, better components in your uh, analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter circuits, more bits, uh, tighter tolerance, and also the devices around those converters can be tighter tolerance. So you're achieving the performance needed for your system. You've used a standard product. You've added external circuitry. And now you're asking yourself the question, how do I specify a derivative so I don't have to buy a custom? And as mentioned earlier, there are certain examples of derivatives. And the manufacturer can modify the internal circuitry to tailor or optimize the product to your specific application. Because they're inside the power supply, they can be more impactful than external changes. A designer should start that process by authoring a list of changes needed, contacting the manufacturer to review, optimize, obtain some test data or a test unit. Then there's going to be a discussion about non-recurring engineering, NRE is whether or not the changes are significant enough to justify um, some documentation changes or safety agency changes. And that expense uh, sometimes is recouped through NRE, so the unit price does not change as much. And going through this process, you can end up with a standard product derivative with a significantly shorter project cycle time and a significantly shorter product cycle time you can avoid uh, larger minimum order quantities and sometimes even avoid a larger total cost. System integration is a key step to ensuring specified performance on the product's data sheet is actually achieved in the end system. We've outlined a number of important high voltage power supply integration topics here line regulation, input ripple current, monitors, static load regulation, and dynamic load regulation. And we've outlined how those characteristics can change based on decisions made during the design process and the system integration. These are items that we recommend you connect with an advanced energy field application engineer to cover and to consider as you go through your design process. There's a lot of material here, uh, specifically to help raise your knowledge 
about those relationships between the specified performance and the actual performance achieved. So let's summarize some of the core items we covered in our presentation today. Specifically, standard product high voltage power supplies are generally a range of devices that enable you to select a higher or lower voltage, higher or lower power with common and similar features and functions and interfacing. And those advantages um, are pretty clear. They uh, have shorter lead time they don't require you to write a specification or fund a developmental effort and yet if your application requires that standard product to be optimized there's an opportunity to do a standard product derivative uh, depending on your needs and of course with the standard product you can allocate space earlier in your design and have an idea how uh, different options in those standard products can give you additional performance in your system We've also covered some key specifications in high voltage, differentiating between nominal performance and higher performance, and covered some topics relating to improving standard product power supply performance outside of the power supply, along with some good design practices and considerations when doing high voltage system integration. You know, as noted on this slide, there's a lot of truth in the phrase, the quality and performance of a system is only as good as its internal components. And so we'd like you to consider that while you're evaluating your high voltage needs and consider the product line that Advanced Energy offers. Advanced Energy offers mission critical precision power solutions and has served the demanding process power OEM markets for over 30 years. Advanced Energy is a NASDAQ publicly traded company that achieved over 480 million in sales in 2016 by offering solutions and support worldwide to 16 sales service support locations, 10 R&D and design centers, and six manufacturing locations. In high voltage, Advanced Energy offers industry-leading catalog, derivative, and custom modules and systems for analytical instruments, medical, industrial, and semiconductor equipment. Advanced Energy team members work to create close strategic partnerships and solutions, not just supply components. Advanced Energy high voltage FAEs, field applications engineers, work towards giving the customer the lowest total cost of product ownership by offering high reliability products. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, question number one, is anything really off the shelf when it comes to high voltage products? Why, yes, some manufacturers maintain a limited inventory of quick ship parts. Advanced Energy uh, has established a quick turn capability for configured standard products. So designers can get the units they need in as little as two to three weeks for some product lines, five to six weeks for others. And we have a second question here. Do all high voltage power supplies have certifications such as CE? Uh, most power supplies in the market that are standard products have CE. Few seem to have UL and other regionally specific uh, approvals or certifications. Advanced Energy strives to have UL for most of its standard product high voltage power supplies. And if you need UL on a product that does not, or you need some other approval applied to a part number, I would uh, suggest contacting your FAE, Field Applications Engineer, to review your requirements. Generally speaking, uh, these types of approvals or certifications uh, 
Uh, they range in time from as little as one to two months to a little bit longer and range in expense. But the good news is most of the standard products already have these approvals. Uh, another question we have is tell me more about high voltage cables and high voltage connector selection and challenges. Well, high voltage cables come in various types. The most popular are silicon insulated and then silicon insulated with semiconductor coating over the center conductor. And then after that, the same type of semiconducting semi center conductor, say that three times fast, with semiconductor coating on the outside of the wire that uh, comes in contact with the shield. So it's a shielded semiconductor. And after that, coaxial. And those are the most popular examples. The silicon insulated, of course, is not shielded. Uh, you'll get a little bit of a field effect off the wire inside the center conductor. Um, and the semiconductor over the center conductor eliminates that field effect. So the wire is uh, more reliable, less chance of a, a point source of energy coming off of the wire and damaging the insulation, less of a, a signature, less field stress. And the silicon wire with the semiconductor coating on the outside followed by a foil wrap or a braid, of course, has the most uniform field because the center conductor has this uniform field by the coating and the outer shield has a uniform field because of the coating. And coaxial, of course, um, is a very common type of shielded cable. Its field stress characteristics are not as good as the triple extruded semiconductive coating we just talked about. However, it is very effective uh, in uh, low noise applications and applications where uh, shielding is, is important, but also uh, adding stored energy for additional filtering is also important. The coaxial cable, like the silicon insulated, will be subject to micro discharge. Uh, there'll be a surface charge, there'll be surface transfer they're both subjected to more field stress because of the localization of the field lines on uh, the wires that make up the braid and the semiconductor. This triple extrusion semiconductor coating will be the best wire for low micro discharge and micro discharge meaning small amounts of energy transfer across the surface of the wire, um, either the center conductor wire or the outside shield. High voltage connectors can be BNC types with those coax cables. They can be BNC types up to about 20 kV. And then after that, they're going to be probably a manufacturer's proprietary type um, pin assembly that goes into some type of a sleeve. There's not much standardization in the market after that 20 kV point for those coaxial cables. For the um, semi, pardon me, for the silicon, You've got a lot of choices with PVC connectors and ABS connectors up to about 50 kV. And then Corona free air exclusion connectors up to about 100 kV. Also, of course, the little micro discharge type connectors. So your advanced energy high voltage FAE can explain the high voltage cables and high voltage connectors on various uh, high voltage products and some of the high voltage best practices given your application. Next question is, how high a voltage is common to work with on PCBs with a standard product? So of course we're assuming this is a PC board mount standard product. So we'll refer to uh, Underwriters Laboratory specification uh, 60950. Uh, the tables in 60950 specify what's called clearance and creepage distances for various grades of insulation um, as a function of working voltage, the degree of pollution in the environment in terms of dust or oils or other contaminants, 
the PCB material type, whether or not there's a coating on the traces. The rule of thumb is 10 volts per mil, uh, also 10 kV per inch. Uh, converted, that's 400 volts per millimeter. With close attention to pad shape, component solder tails, and PC board slots, 6 kV on a circuit board is not that uncommon. Your advanced energy high voltage FAE can assist in reviewing your layout and that high voltage section to share some best practices. And if you need to go above 10 kV, of course, there's some extra effort you have to put in watching uh, nearby shields and um, taking a look at uh, various uh, effects that occur because of ionization and corona. Okay, next question. What difference does high voltage ripple and noise make? Well, given all we've talked about uh, with ripple and noise, that's not a surprising question. So the answer is uh, little difference or none at one end of the scale or a very significant difference at the other end of the scale, depending on the application. So with unshielded high voltage leads, the ripple and noise can impact nearby circuitry. So even though your application may not be sensitive to ripple and noise, the nearby circuitry could become sensitive to the RFI from the ripple and noise. So you might have to shield the cable or you might have to filter the ripple and noise. At levels above what is considered acceptable for your intended load and application, uh, meaning the ripple and noise is above what your application can tolerate. If you have an emitter of energy, like an electron beam or an ion beam, that energy could be spread over a broader range of physical space. If you're in a pulse power application and you're storing energy in a capacitor or you're pulsing uh, a device, you could be pulsing at the peak of the AC ripple or the valley and see a difference in energy. And if you're measuring the output of a process, the detectors could fail to measure accurately. With a higher um, noise level, your signal to noise level could be lower and it's harder to discriminate the actual signal from what you're trying to measure. When ripple and noise are at an acceptable level for your application, the interaction is transparent. So you can test how much of a guard band you have by adding some additional filtering, seeing if there's any change in performance in your application. And if there is no change in performance, then you know that you at least have a reasonable amount of headroom before you impact your application. Our next question, is ground the same for high voltage as low voltage? Another uh, interesting question. So chassis ground and earth ground are the only true grounds. All other grounds are a signal or a power path to ground. Uh, the phrase ground is just another signal comes to mind. In high voltage, the most direct return from the high voltage load and stored high voltage energy back to high voltage return is really the safest and the most reliable method to manage that energy. And the reason for that is, as an example, a 10 kV high voltage power supply with a small amount of output capacitance, you know, tens of picofarads, from cabling or loading can generate 100 to 1,000 amps during an arc. That surge energy has to be managed. If that was to appear across an impedance in some other part of your system, it could induce very large voltages, kilovolts, which would cause damage to circuitry. So you don't want to mix high voltage return energy with your analog or digital signal grounds that can lead to damaged signal circuits. And you don't want to mix that energy with low voltage power supply grounds as that can lead to damaged power supplies. 
Now the next question is what are the pros and cons of AC input versus DC input? Well, beyond the obvious that DC is generally used in battery and portable applications, the trend towards more and more DC to high voltage DC power supplies in the standard pro product marketplace is because these lower power supplies, typically milliwatts to let's say a couple hundred watts, are operating within a distributed power system. And a distributed power system offers a lower total system cost because of the sharing of components on the AC to DC front end and it's an efficient method of moving um, power throughout an entire system through cabling and connectors and fusing at these lower power levels. AC input, however, is generally used for higher power levels because it's an efficient method of moving significant average power without additional power conversion steps, especially before other um, power conversion devices or transformers. So it reduces a system's total power consumption because each conversion step causes a loss of some percentage of the power. And it also reduces the need for cooling, relatively speaking, to, again, a system that has more power conversion steps. Because these can be significant factors if you're operating at the kilowatt level or the 10 or 100 kilowatt level. A difference of efficiency uh, on a 30 watt DC to high voltage DC supply of 5% is 5% of 30 watts. It's not a lot of power. Additional power stage uh, conversions on, an, on a high average power, such as 100 kilowatts or 10 kilowatts, can be very significant. If you lost 10% of 100 kilowatts, you'd have to deal with 10 kilowatts of lost energy that has to be replaced and 10 kilowatts worth of additional cooling. Certainly not preferred. And it looks like based on the time, we have time for one more question. And after that, I'd ask that uh, folks continue to send their questions in and we'll respond to them. And additionally, you should feel free to reach out to your uh, local uh, field applications engineer for high voltage. And that question is, what are the pros and cons of analog control versus digital control? So analog control has been the standard, of course, for decades. It's more common in set and forget applications. It's certainly more common in some mission critical applications because of the aversion to software. And, you know, if there's a legacy system that's being revised, that legacy system might be, of course, analog and therefore to, to manage the cost of doing an upgrade to a system that's in production, it's often kept the same architecture, so to speak, which is analog. And the simplicity of components and controls in analog is generally a good a good place to stay or a good design technique to keep in place in those types of systems. Digital control is more common in complex systems, newly designed systems, and that's because they already feature uh, microprocessor or microcontroller architectures, and those architectures enable applications to have optimized uh, features and functions such as power sequencing, voltage limits, current limits, uh, programmable slew rates, and also because of the monitoring and the controls and uh, uh, lookup tables, there's an ability to uh, do reconfiguration and recalibration, and therefore, of course, get higher performance out of the system. And again, because of those monitors and controls, there's an ability to identify faults, have pre-programmed fault responses to protect emitters or detectors or uh, 
product is being processed. And also it can be used to automate diagnostics, which can uh, reduce downtime and also reduce uh, the bad uh, any any portion of bad product that's produced by a system or not properly um, inspected by a system. So of course, going forward, we highly recommend uh, looking at uh, digital. And uh, again, we look forward to any additional questions you might have uh, or anything you'd like to discuss with our high voltage FAEs.